Today, I'm joined by Ferrella partner Greg Lassaint to discuss the movie John Wick and the Corporate Transparency Act. Greg breaks down what you need to know about this federal law that went into effect on January 1st of 2024. What is it? What is its purpose? And some common exemptions. Does this law affect the continental? What would John Wick name his living trust? We talk about those questions and more. So let's get right into it. Because yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. Welcome to The Verdict, estate planning through film. Brought to you by the private client group at Ferrella Braun and Martell. I'm Hans Young, a family wealth partner at Ferrella. Through this podcast, my guests and I will provide an entertaining look at family wealth and estate planning topics through well known Hollywood movies. Each episode will focus on a single movie as we discuss fun facts, review our favorite scenes, and engage in thought provoking discussions of real world legal issues. And lastly, do you agree with our verdict? Is the movie a guilty pleasure or just not guilty? Again, welcome to The Verdict, estate planning through film. I'm excited to have my colleague and fellow partner, Greg LaSaint, as my guest on the podcast today. Greg's practice focuses on corporate and financial transactions, including mergers and acquisitions, secured lending, fund formation, corporate finance, secondary and derivative transactions, restructurings, and general corporate representation. He is a trusted advisor to owners, operating companies, family offices, private equity and real estate funds, banks, private clients, high-tech executives, entrepreneurs, and investors. I am sure the high table would love to have them on their team. So I'm glad he's on ours. Greg, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Hans. So as I was putting together ideas for this podcast uh, series several months ago, I had approached you about being one of my first guests. Uh, Wanted to talk about the Corporate Transparency Act since you're one of our in-house experts on the subject. We actually had it originally had a different movie in mind um, for us to discuss I think throughout that conversation, we both discovered we love John Wick. I already had that movie actually on my potential list of movies for this podcast. Uh, so this was perfect. Let's get right into it. I want to start some, with some fun facts about the movie. Uh, I found my, some of these, not all of them, on John Wiki, uh, which sounds even better than Wikipedia. So I assume they must be true. The movie released on October 24th, 2014, leading up to it, Keanu Reeves had a a number of, I, I think they were kind of bombs, um, at least whether it was box office or critical reception. Uh, he was headed kind of into that direct-to-DVD territory. And in fact, Lionsgate saved this movie from going direct-to-DVD at the last minute. The movie grossed, ended up grossing $86 million on a small budget of 20 to $30 million, I think. So obviously a great gamble and a great move by them. It found an extremely wide audience when it started streaming. For me, I didn't know anything about the movie. Didn't know it was coming out. I streamed it at home for the first time with, you know, load and zero expectations and immediately loved it. Uh, got drawn into this whole world that they've created, I think, like so many others did. Quite frankly, it's an action movie experience. I'm still chasing 10 years later with action movies that I watch today. When did you watch it for the first time? How did you hear about it? What were your thoughts? Yeah. So one of the reasons I think this movie is one of my favorites. I was actually living in New York City at the time when it came out. Right, this was 2014. I was working at, at, at a law firm there. And, you know, and it was always intense as it was. You know, we wore suits every day and we battled it out. And I went to go see this movie having no expectations whatsoever. I didn't even really know what it was about because it was such a low-key release. And I think I just had an evening to go watch it. I saw it in the theater and I just thought it was such a fresh action movie that was something that I hadn't really seen before in terms of just the choreography of the action. The story was very simple. It had this nice kind of moral anchor to it about, you know, this man seeking revenge uh, for, you know, it seems like somewhat of a lofty purpose, depending on how you want to spin it. But um, it just had everything that I, I liked. And it was just so um, just so fresh at the time. And I just loved all the panning shots of New York. I knew where all of the all the scenes were where it was taking place. And it was just such a fun, easy movie to watch. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think that's so cool that you're in New York at the time. Um, and as far as the choreography, definitely, I think I've read, I didn't coin this term, but I, I read it, but I would definitely agree with it. I think it describes it properly, but it was the first movie, at least, I don't know if it was the very first, but it felt like the first in my life where it was gun Fu. Is it's like martial arts, but with his with his handgun, and he did a lot of that that I hadn't seen before. Um, 
So yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it was, it blew me away the first time. And obviously it spanned, it, it spawned three sequels and counting now. So some other fun facts just about this movie. Uh, Keanu says a total of, well, I get, how, how many words do you think he has in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, 150? No, not, not quite yet. So, <laughs> so a single, a single page of paper type single space is about 500 words generally. Okay. He has, he says 484 words in the movie. Uh, okay. Through it, yeah. Uh, it actually goes down with each success. Uh, it, I think with each movie, um, uh, he did 90% of his own stunts. That's according to himself. So I, 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 I've seen some of the behind the scenes, um, scenes and action scenes. And, and he's definitely, it seems like he put a lot of, into the training. His salary is rumored to have been, I think only one, two million on the movie for the first one. Cause again, people had very low expectations. Uh, so if you take the average of that one and a half million dollars, he basically made $3,100 a word, which is, which is not bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was going to also ask you, what do you think his kill count in the movie is? Total kill count. It, I'll um, say this. It was lower than I had originally thought. I'm going to guess it's in the 60s. That's pretty close. It's 77. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think as, again, as the movies go on, I, I think it gets like, I think John Wick 4 is pretty, it's like in the, in the 200s or something like that. It gets crazy. <laughs> The tattoo across John's back, I, I'm going to butcher it if it's in Latin. If you know how to say it, feel free to say it. But it's it's Latin and it means fortune favors the bold. Uh, don't test me on my Latin here, but that is exactly <laughs> what it means, which is a, That's right. a fantastic thing. <laughs> and maybe the, the last fact I thought was interesting was the exterior of the Continental, you probably know this already, is the Beaver Building located at uh, One Wall Street Court in New York City. Yeah, I actually I saw that as well, and you know I I lived in that area, not too far from there, and it's it's such a nice classical area of New York City, uh, and so it doesn't surprise me that they picked that for the architecture there. Yeah, yeah, very cool. And I guess yeah, actually, I mean, let me throw one more in here. This is for for those who love cars, and again, I might end up butchering some of these names even, but he's supposed to be driving a 1969 Ford Mustang Boss, Ford 29. But it's in fact a Ford Mustang Mach One. I wouldn't have known that if you, you know, if you told me. <laughs> uh, he later drives a 1970s Chevrolet Chevelle SS 396 from Aurelio's shop. That's the car he gets after his his car is initially stolen. And then later, the Continental makes a gift to him of the 2011 Dodge Charger X SXT, which was an interesting choice. I thought. Given the, well, I think I think they were trying to cover all of the muscle car American fanboys yeah. there because you got Ford, you got Chevy, and then he ends up with the Dodge Charger. That's so. a good theory. I also thought it was given that the other two are older, more classic cars. They destroy that 2011 Dodge Charger. They beat it up pretty good, <laughs> and I thought maybe that was just a, a cost cutting measure, given that it was a small budget. But who knows? Let's move on to the next scene uh, or favorite scene. I'm going to give you seven. Just because that rounds us out, gives us some some options to choose from. Um, and I'm going to go through them really quick. So the first one, we have just what starts it all. Yosef breaks into John's home, steals his car, kills his dog, Daisy. Next scene, Vigo, Yosef's father, informs him of the legend of John Wick, kind of who he is and who's really coming after him. There's the fight with Vigo's crew at John's home and then the subsequent cleanup. There's the fight with Vigo's crew at the Red Circle, the nightclub there. And then there's the fight with Miss Perkins in John's hotel room when she tries to take him out on continental grounds, which proves deadly for her. There's John finds Yosef at the safe house finally and, and eventually gets him. And then there's the final fight with Vigo on uh, the roof uh, as Vigo's trying to, to get on the helicopter to escape. What was your favorite scene? So, you know, getting back to what you were saying earlier about the gun foo, I thought the home invasion was just really fantastic because that's where you've heard the legend told of Baba Yaga by Vigo. And you get to finally see, OK, what is this guy actually all about? And it's it's really well done. He gets cleaned up. He puts on his suit. He's ready for these guys to show up at his house and he's lurking in the shadows like a boogeyman would. 
And then you get that that sort of amazing fight choreography that just shows, okay, this is like a very unique movie here. And it's just very slick, very well done. And it kind of, and it ends with the cop shows up, Jimmy shows up at the door and he, he sees all the bodies in there and he says, everything all right in here, John? And so you, you also get, and then the cleanup happens with Charlie's crew. And so it you see that it, the movie doesn't take itself that seriously. That is really fun. Um, and you get to really see just how awesome this character is going to be in terms of an action movie. And at this point, you know, I'm in the theater. I'm only a third of the way through my popcorn. And so I know I've got a good time left ahead of me as long as as long as this holds up. So I, I love that scene. Yeah, yeah. No, that was great because I think up until this point, right, they had it. They had had the scene where, again, Vigo informs Joseph about how legendary this guy is. He killed a guy with a pencil, but we'd never seen John in action. And I think that was the first real scene. And really, we only saw him get beat up. And you're like, how good can this guy be? You know, he's got his dog st- you know, killed, and, uh, got his car stolen from him. But yeah, I agree that I think this is this is the moment in the movie where you're like, wow, this is different. Yeah, I, I had as my favorite, I think it was kind of the the, the next big scene, which is the fight with... Vigo's crew at the Red Circle. I thought that whole thing was just the whole sequence was really well choreographed. I also think it's just funny that Yosef, who's been told by everyone he knows in in his entire gang, his old crew is told him this guy's dangerous. He's coming after you. He's he's one of a kind. And like his way of protecting himself was like, I'm going to go in a swimming pool and drink and just party. I thought it was pretty funny that that's it. that was his response. But yeah, I thought I, I really enjoyed that sequence. And, and again, it really showcased just the number of guys he can take on, which of course takes on like almost absurd. <laughs> uh, it, it gets to absurd levels in the later movies where the number of guys he can take out uh, just single-handedly is, <laughs> is, is pretty crazy. Yeah, definitely. I, I like how the, the two scenes kind of mirror one another because he at first he's on the defense defending his home and then he decides I'm going to go on the offense and you've got the the decadence of the nightclub, all the Russian gangsters tolling around Yosef. Yeah, right. Not expecting him. And then, you know, sort of playing very proud. And then you get to see just I, I love where he moves on to the dance floor while he's chasing Yosef and you get the heavy music and people are dancing and he's still uh, going about his business <laughs> as he does. <laughs> so that's a great scene. Yeah. And I think they take that, that sort of dance scene where they've got the heavy, the heavy bass going. They, they recreate that. I think in a, at least one, I think I forget if it's number two or number three, but they definitely do that again. Um, did you have a runner up? Well, I guess I think I told you beforehand that the home invasion and red circle, they're sort of the iconic, John Wick scenes. Um, and like, I do like how they, they mirror each other in some ways there. And you can see both sides of, of his, of his action abilities. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah. My second one was my runner up was again, not heavy on the action sequences, but it's just when Yosef goes and, and sees Vigo um, in the beginning of the movie. And he's just, Vigo's warning him about John Wick and how he's, yeah, Baba Yaga and telling him about the legend and, and Yosef just doesn't seem phased. He's like, I mean, this guy's old. We already beat him up once. Like, what's the big deal? Which, when you know how it ends, you sort of you think it's it's ludicrous that his reaction is that is that mild. But I guess if you put yourself in his shoes, yeah, you you just stole his car and you just killed his dog and you broke into his house and he put up no fight whatsoever. He came down in his PJs. Um, I guess the thought would be that yeah, this guy's not a threat. So I want to. Also move on. I know we have a lot to talk about. And I, I know most of what we wanted to focus on today is the Corporate Transparency Act. And I thought it'd be fun to talk about th- some of those rules, but in this John Wick world. So I want to move on to planning opportunities. It's a section where we, uh, again, take on some of the substantive issues from a legal perspective, but do it in a way that we're going to weave it through a discussion of the movie. And it probably warrants a discussion first or a quick overview of what is the Corporate Transparency Act? I'll let you answer these questions, but I'll say that it's my understanding is it's a it's a new federal law that went into effect on January 1st of this year. Its general purpose is to combat illicit activity, including tax fraud, money laundering, and financing for terrorism. 
by making it clear who the individuals behind a particular business entity are. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. The only thing I would really add to that, I think that's a great summary, is just really the federal agency that is involved here. So this comes from, well, the, the, the act was passed by Congress. It is a federal statute. It's uh, overseen by the Treasury Department. So they have, the Treasury Department has its own financial crimes enforcement network, which is the Department of the Treasury that's tasked with overseeing money laundering activities and illicit activities such as funding of terrorism and things like that. But the statute itself does allow really a broader network of federal agencies to see this information. So this would also include the IRS, I believe the FBI would also have access to this. So, but you are exactly right in terms of its purpose, in terms of its timing. So it is live now. We are living within this statute and it's important for business owners. It's important for businesses in general to understand this and be able to plan accordingly and file these reports because there are consequences to not doing so. Yeah. And I want to talk about the Continental, kind of look at these, and we call it the Corporate Transparency Act. I think we often refer to it as the CTA for short, and feel free to do that going forward. But I want to look at the rules of the CTA and some of the basics, but through the Continental Hotel. So we know that this is kind of home base for the New York part or, or, or a faction of the high table. Uh, High Table is the kind of the larger network of this crime syndicate that's it looks like sounds like worldwide. Uh, we, we obviously learn that later as they expand that the John Wick universe. But the Continental is the New York branch of it, and it's run by uh, Ian McShane's character Winston. He's either the owner or the manager, um, and then Lance Reddick, who plays the hotel manager, is the the Continental's concierge. Not all companies are subject to the CTA, correct? Are there some exemptions? So I think was as a start, if you're the Continental and you're Winston and you're the concierge, uh, you get together and you've just been told this new law is now in effect and you might have to comply, what would you be looking at? And what, what are you looking at first or thinking about first? Just stepping back for a moment here, again, the, the name of the act is the Corporate Transparency Act. And what it's really geared at is creating transparency anytime you use a corporate entity, corporate meaning any legal body that's used to organize business interests. And so these are commonly limited liability companies, corporations or corporate entities, limited partnerships. So really it's anything that is created by the filing of a document with the secretary of state of your state or the similar office in whatever jurisdiction you're within, within the United States. So anytime you use one of these entities, there's a separation between the owners who are the equity holders of this business and then the business itself. And so, you know, the basic, one of the basic concepts of corporate law is that you, you limit the liability of your shareholders, of your equity holders by forming this corporate body um, that's sanctioned by the state and formed by the state and registered with the state. What that process has done, it's given this benefit of actually masking who the owners of that business are. So that business can go conduct business in its own name. It can sign contracts in its business name. And so in the context of money laundering, of illicit financing of activities, you can see where that might lead to maybe perhaps an unintended benefit of this privacy of the shareholders and members. Now you can argue as to whether or not that privacy is intentional or not, but the fact of the matter is, is that it is a side effect of having these corporate bodies that are sanctioned by the state. And so what the Corporate Transparency Act does is it creates transparency. It looks through that veil that the corporation creates by forming this entity with the state. And it says, who are the actual individuals, people, not other entities, not other organizations, not trusts, people, individuals who are actually in control of this company, managing it and deciding what it does, how its money moves. Um, and so taking the example of the Continental, you have this business, this hotel, maybe it is indirectly owned by the high table. Let's just assume that it's broadly held by several different shareholders, or maybe there's maybe there's four or five shareholders that hold it. What the Corporate Transparency Act says, it says anyone who owns 25% of this directly or indirectly. So again, whether or not it's through another entity, whether they hold it directly, that individual is a beneficial owner. And then there's a separate test in terms of if you are, if you have substantial control over that entity, then you're also a beneficial owner. So for something like the Continental, it would look at it and, and say, well, is it a corporate entity? 
And the answer is probably, let's just assume yes. But as you mentioned, there are exemptions from this. So the, the again, the, the idea is not to pick up every single business. There are highly regulated businesses throughout the United States that that don't really need the same type of policing because they have so many touches with law enforcement by virtue of other regulations that are in place. So there are 23 exemptions under the statute for entities that are less likely to be engaging in uh, money laundering. So the, 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 the statute, if you look in the commentary, it's really geared towards shell entities, although you'll see it picks up a lot more than just shell entities. And that's really where I think a lot of the the issues for a lot of clients lie is when you're sort of between, you maybe maybe don't meet the threshold for an exemption, but for something like the Continental, typically for a business like that, you might look at the large operating company exemption. So that's one of these 23 exemptions. And it says, even if you are a corporate entity, you are not a reporting company for purposes of the CTA because you are exempt. You're going to be subject to regulation on a wider basis. So we don't really need to look through your ownership. And also, there's a practical matter here about, you know, for instance, public companies in terms of looking through a beneficial ownership of those. It just becomes impractical to do the exercise for some companies. And since the SEC is regulating them, the, the IRS and the, the, sorry, the Treasury doesn't feel like they need to be regulated as highly. But so for a large operating company, that would be anything that any business company, corporate entity that employs more than 20 full time employees within the United States. It has a physical operating office in the United States, and it's filed a federal income tax or information return in the United States for the previous year, demonstrating more than $5 million in gross receipts. So that, that's going to pick up a lot of operating businesses. But in my practice with some of our clients, you might own a company that's on the bubble for those tests. And at any point you either meet or fail to meet one of those prongs, you are no longer subject to the exemption and you might become a reporting company or you might become exempt. So there's there's certain lines that particular clients, particular businesses really want to pay attention to with this. Yeah. And it would sound like based on the 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 factors that you mentioned in terms of what constitutes a large operating company for that exemption, chances are pretty high that the Continental qualifies. I mean, it, it, it's a full service hotel. It's got probably more than 20 full-time employees. It's definitely got a physical office, I would imagine, in the U.S., probably in the, in the hotel itself. And uh, I guess it depends on how you how you value a gold coin in John Wick's universe. But uh, it seems like whenever he stays there, he pays one gold coin. I don't know if that's per night, but um, $5 million threshold, maybe, maybe low for gold coins. The, the spot price for an ounce of gold is like, Twenty three, twenty four hundred dollars right now. So I think, um, you know, based on how you know, it costs you one to get into the the club downstairs. I think I, I'm guessing they they're they're pulling in more than five million dollars in groceries. I would hope a downtown Manhattan luxury hotel is doing more than five million a year. But depends on how many of those gold coins are off the books, which which is a, a good you know thing to think about. With you know, gold is is a useful item for money laundering. Um, <laughs> so yeah. it is used in illicit. So <laughs> assuming they have some sort of legitimate front, they're taking on some guests who maybe aren't assassins, who are just the regular couple from out of town that, that just happened to find this place on, you know, TripAdvisor and they're not interested in any, I, I bet they're pulling in more than 5 million from those people. I've always wondered, I, I don't know if the movie makes it explicitly clear that there are other non-assassin, non-high table guests there. I would imagine there are, but that's got to be a crazy to to suddenly <laughs> witness <laughs> some I mean because there there's a whole scene with um when he, when John captures Miss Perkins. I mean, he's just he's out in the hallway. I mean, there's no I mean, you imagine if you stayed on that floor and you'd happen to come out to grab yourself a, a cup of water, um you see John there <laughs> Well, I think that's why they're so strict about the rules of no business activity yeah. on the grounds, because they have a couple from Cleveland, Ohio, visiting downstairs, and they don't know that all of this side business happens there, and they, they, they intend to keep it that way. That's yeah, my theory. I, th that, that's got to be right. That that's why they have that policy. I mean, we know Ms. Perkins breaks that policy, I think, for $4 million. I think the price on his head had, get, had gone up from initially two, and I think they offered her four. 
um, Vigo offered her four to basically break the rules, and she does, and uh, it ultimately leads to her demise. I don't know in hindsight if $4 million would have been worth it, but uh, but she that's what she did. Well, it was 2014, so that was 10 years ago. $4 million. You got to adjust for inflation, I think. So This is true. <laughs> so assuming that it meets these requirements, then probably Winston's looking at not needing to be uh, sub or not needing to be subject to the CTA, in which case there's there's not a reporting obligation, correct? That's right. And if you think, you know, the high table is an international organization. And so the Corporate Transparency Act doesn't stop with U.S. domestic persons. If you are a foreign person and you're a beneficial owner, you would, the company would have to report you. So Remember, the, the obligations under the CTA really apply to the company itself and the people who really manage the company. So if you have a foreign investor who is a beneficial owner under under the act, you would have to report them. But in this instance, um, I think we can probably assume they are exempt and don't need to worry about it. Well, let's take um, the, the other company that comes up throughout the course of the movie, and um, I think we see it two times, is Charlie's Cleaner cleaning service. So it's the Charlie's specialized waste and disposal. And we see it for the first time after the home invasion at John's home. I think he had maybe like 13 bodies to dispose of and he calls and uh, he makes a dinner reservation for 13 or however many he's got. And I think that's clearly the code for uh, how many bodies need to be disposed of. He gives a gold coin for each body to Charlie. Um, do you want to look at that? And And since it's a smaller company, uh, I think we only meet Charlie and, and he's got maybe two or three guys with him that help him clean. And let's assume he, he's even got a team that's twice as large as that. It's probably, I don't think he fulfills probably the 20 full-time employees requirement and uh, probably has a physical office in the U.S., I would think, but maybe not more than $5 million in gross receipts. I don't know. I don't know if he's doing this for uh, just the Continental or if it's got a broader, you know, broader clientele uh, base than that. But um, let's just presume that it's small enough such that it doesn't qualify for this large operating company exemption. If it's subject to the requirements of the CTA, how does a company like Charlie's comply? Yeah. So, you know, if you just take on screen, he's got, I think it's he and two other gentlemen show up. So let's, if you assume there's only two or three employees to this business, it's not going to meet one of the prongs. Remember, you have to meet all three prongs to get the large operating company exemption. So the first thing is to understand when you need to file your initial report. Okay, so if he is if he is organized as an LLC, I mean, I think we have to assume he's organized as an LLC or a S corporation or something. This is his own business; he owns it, and he he's not a, a sole proprietor. He doesn't just own it in his own individual name. If he did own it in his own individual name, he wouldn't be subject to the Corporate Transparency Act because there's no corporate entity there. So the first thing, to, assuming he's formed it as an LLC, um, if he formed it before January 1st, 2024, which presumably he did because this movie's from 10 years ago, um, he would have until January 1st of 2025 to make his initial beneficial ownership report. If he formed it during this calendar year, 2024, he would have 90 days from the date on which the Secretary of State sends him back his notice saying, here's your official filing your, your, um, for, a, for an LLC. It would be your, um, your certificate of organization, your articles of organization in California. Once 90 days from that, his, his initial report would be due. And starting in 2025, if he were to form in 2025, he would have 30 days instead of 90 days to make that initial filing. Yeah, you think um as a side note, you think at one point Charlie had a legitimate cleaning service? <laughs> I, and just did a yeah. really good job, caught the attention of uh of Winston. And he's like, you know what you could do that would help me? I guess you could start off in either direction. Either you start off with the body disposal company and realize you need some sort of cover for it, <laughs> or you showed up and you just did a really good job cleaning someone's house and and someone just says, hey, I, I, I have this situation out back. Can you help me with this as well? And suddenly, you know, your life just takes a, a dramatic turn towards the uh, <laughs> towards the realm of criminal activity. So, yeah, maybe it'd be good to talk about uh, in filing a beneficial ownership report. What type of information has to be included? What would Charlie be filling out? 
So, okay. So let's assume again, he formed this before 2024. Let's start in 2024. If you were starting a, a company today, there's really three things you need to include in your initial report. That is information about the reporting company. That is the company that's making the filing information about each of its beneficial owners. So those are the people that own it or control that company. And then you also have to submit what are called, what is called the information for the company applicants. And so those are the individuals who actually were in charge of filing your articles of organization or your certificate of incorporation, whatever it is with the secretary of state. So there's three things. If you're a pre-2024 entity, you do not have to make any filing on your company applicants. So this is only for newly formed entities now. But so pre-2024, you still have to file your reporting company information. That's going to be the name of your reporting company. That's going to be any DBAs, trade names, anything you're known as for that company, your current address for your office, the state or jurisdiction in which you're formed, and your IRS taxpayer identification number. If you're a foreign reporting company, so this does apply to foreign companies that are formed outside the United States but are registered to do business in the United States, you have similar requirements. And then, again, for each of those beneficial owners, you need to provide their full legal name, their date of birth, their complete residential address, so not P.O. box, not, not a business address for them, but actually the home in which they live, then a unique identifying number from a non-expired passport, state ID, or driver's license, and an image of that document that you get the number from. So all of that for each beneficial owner needs to be reported. And just note that there is no limit on the number of beneficial owners. You could have as many as, as meet the test. So it's not so just because you know you have one doesn't mean you don't have multiple beneficial owners. And then for the company applicants, again, this only applies to newly formed entities. That is going to be the full legal name of those people, the date of birth. For their address, if they're in the business of forming entities, such as attorneys, filing services, they can use their business address. They don't have to use their home address, but then they also need to give their unique state ID, passport number, and a picture of that of that document as well. Got it. And so after the initial filing, you include all this information. Charlie thinks he's all set. Is there information that he's got to update on a regular basis? And if so, what are those? Yeah, so the this is where it gets this the statute gets a little bit where the regulation gets a little bit tricky because the way it reads is that if any information in your report changes, you have to file an update within 30 days of that change. So what that means is even for let's say your beneficial owner, your 25% shareholder moves to a new home. Uh, well, their residential address has changed at that point. So the information in your report has changed and you have 30 days in order to file that updated report with FinCEN. Now that gets, you run into the issue there of, well, how do I know if my beneficial ownership information has changed? And so it really puts companies in a tricky position of having to be aware of information that they're not typically aware of. You wouldn't normally have your shareholders tell you whenever they move to a new address or when they renew their driver's license for that matter. This is where I think probably the, the biggest issue with compliance uh, really lies with this statute is being aware of all of those changes in ownership information. Now, the things that are simple are if your manager changes, if you appoint a new senior officer. So there are some designations. If you have a new CEO, if you have a new CFO, there's a, a, a litany of senior officer positions that anytime any peer person who sits in that office is going to be a beneficial owner, no matter what, because again, it's not just, you don't have to own any equity in the company to be a quote unquote beneficial owner here. You just have to have some level of substantial control. So anytime, you know, and those, those, those items are a little easier to track, you know, typically for privately held companies, you're well aware of when equity interests are transferring between owners you're aware of when new managers are being appointed. So those are all within the control of the company. But it's that point I was making before about there's some information here that would change. And based on the regulation, you would be not in compliant with the regulation if you did not report that to FinCEN, even though you might not necessarily be aware of it. Yeah. It would seem to, to just put a huge administrative burden on on the reporting companies because, as you said, a lot of this information is very 
specific. And in some cases, like addresses and things that change probably fairly frequently, depending on the size of your organization. It's a lot to keep track of if you're going to try to follow it exactly. Right. And what they've done is there is a shortcut in the regulation. and But there is what I think of as, um, I don't want to call it, is it a trick? It's a, um, it's a quirk to the regulation where they've introduced this concept of FinCEN identifiers. So these are 12 digit numbers, unique numbers that any person can go on FinCEN's BOI website. Already, you can dis- disclose to FinCEN directly your home information, your name, your date of birth, your, your residential address. You can upload your driver's license and they'll just give you this 12 digit identifier. Well, now the reporting company, instead of collecting your driver's license, instead of getting your home address, your date of birth, and all of that is personally identifiable information. So there's risk to that whenever you're sending that over email channels, it's going to end up on someone's hard drive somewhere, and then it's going to be disclosed to FinCEN. So if your beneficial owner, if your company applicant has a FinCEN identifier, that makes things vastly easier for the reporting company because all you have to do in that situation is just put the number on there. And this is where I say the quirk comes in because when a person applies for a FinCEN identifier, the burden of making the update for their residential information, for their driver's license, for any information on that beneficial owner, that burden actually shifts to the person who applied for the FinCEN identifier. So it removes the burden from the company. The company no longer has any liability for not disclosing that someone moved to a new address or got a new driver's license. It, but it shifts to that person who actually made the filing. So now you have a situation where you know, this, the regulation was really designed to, to hone in on these companies and to have them in compliance and regulation. You have this administrative quirk where it's actually quite burdensome. And it can be quite burdensome and cumbersome to collect all this information change. You know, if you have 15 entities in your organization and you have the same beneficial owners at different entities and you have to report a, you have to upload a driver's license, give the name, date of birth, and fill this out on all these other forms that becomes quite cumbersome. The FinCEN identifier cuts through all of that, but it shifts the burden. So, you know, if I'm a CFO at a company and the company tells me you have to get a FinCEN identifier, okay, that's fine. I'll go do that. But are they also telling me that I now have the burden of telling FinCEN within 30 days of me changing addresses that my information has changed. So it, 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 I think it's it's a place where there's there's a va- there's a great convenience to be gained by using the FinCEN identifiers. But I think people do need to be aware that it does shift this burden onto the beneficial owners. Yeah, and I, I think given how sensitive uh, a lot of this information that's required to be reported is, and the fact that many of our clients, if not all of our clients, and particularly our high net worth and ultra high net worth clients who have privacy concerns, they are submitting a lot of sensitive personal information through this reporting obligation. I think their question would be, is this reported information once it's given over to FinCEN, is it made public? Is Outside of, I guess, anything you send digitally has the opportunity or the there's the opportunity for someone to hack it and retrieve it that way. But outside of that scenario, is this information public once it's given over to FinCEN? It's not public yet. Um, we don't, you know, they could change the law in the future and say this will be a public database. You know, some states have um, been enacting similar statutes at a, at a state level and they go back and forth on whether the information is going to be public. Uh, but for now, it's, it is a non-public database. It is accessible by like federal law enforcement agencies. State law enforcement can access it, but they have to, I believe they have to apply for that access. They have to have a reason to do so. And then um, banks and financial institutions are going to, they, they will be able to use it for KYC purposes. But that, you know, that's already information that these people would otherwise be giving to them. But, but to answer your question, no, it's not supposed to be public. Obviously, it's a database. It's, it's, it's at risk of hacking and, you know, other attacks on it. So there, there are ways that the information could potentially get out, but it's certainly not intended to. That's not the, that's not the point. And I think um, if we've just, if we're sitting across from Charlie, we've just explained all this. I could see Charlie saying, you know what? 
this all sounds great. I'm not going to do that. I'm not doing any of this. I'm not complying. I'm not reporting. What would you tell him are the consequences of not complying with the CTA? Well, it's very clear. And it's unfortunate that he said he's really being willful there in his non-compliance because the, the regulation does require willful failure to not comply. So um, is there, you know, does that leave wiggle room for negligence? So I just didn't know about this statute. That's not clear. It seems like they're they're setting the bar fairly high for criminal and civil penalties, but that could include fines of up to $10,000 imprisonment for two years or both. But the commissioner of the Department of Treasury has made different statements about, you know, really this is supposed to be directed towards money laundering. It is supposed to be directed towards illicit activity. It's not meant to, you know, pick up the mom and pop businesses that you know, maybe they just forgot to make their filing. Obviously, I'd, I would never give that advice to anyone. It's, you know, the statute's real. It has teeth. There's penalties here. So it's always best to be in compliance. But they have set the standard as as willful failure. So it's there's something here about, you know, intentionally not making your filing. My, my guess is that this statute is going to be used um, as more of add-on offenses for something. But it's the, the basic purpose of it is to create this vast database initially. And if Really, it's the, where I, I think people are going to experience liability with it, I'm just, and this is just me guessing, is as an add-on when they're already doing something illicit. But this is really just going to be used as a tool to find that illicit activity. Yeah, it's great. And I, I want to also move on and talk about, especially in the family wealth group, a lot of our clients are have companies, LLCs that it hold assets of theirs, but they also have trusts. And I noticed in your description of what the CTA encompasses, you said that it's entities that are registered with the Secretary of State. Trusts are not. And I, I wanted to explore that. So the ownership of John's home. So we know he's got a, a, a great little personal residence. He and his wife were living in. His wife dies. He now lives in this big house by himself. I assume that even while he was married, given that what we do know is there's some Someone has a line in there about him being out of the assassin life for about five years. Um, so he he had escaped the, the the reaches of the high table, gotten married, started this out this life outside of the only life he knew at that time. He's bought a home. I would assume that he didn't own that home in his own name. You know, it wasn't uh, Jonathan Wick and Helen Wick, a married uh, husband and wife as their community property. I would think he probably put it uh, in an LLC or a trust. This kind of goes into some of the privacy planning that a lot of our clients do, where um, if they hold their real estate in an LLC, then the deed itself is titled in the name of that LLC. And especially if they have someone else signing on behalf of the LLC who's authorized to do so, that the client's own personal name won't appear there. And so there's, again, a degree of anonymity. Again, with alternatively with a trust... He might have had a trust. And if often what clients will do if they don't want to go through registering an LLC or a limited partnership or something like that with the state, they'll just have it held in their revocable living trust. In that scenario, they can give the trust any name. There's no requirement under state law that the trust have a specific name. And so, you know, in John's case, I, I imagine a world, I, I hope for this world, where he called it the Baba Yaga Family Trust. And that's how he might hold his home, hold ownership of this house. Um, in that case, again, the, it, there's a degree of anonymity in the sense that the trust name is on the deed or on title. His personal name is not, but he would still, someone needs to sign on behalf of the trust. And given that it's his revocable living trust, he's created it while he's living. It is fully revocable and he's got unfettered discretion as to the assets while he's alive. He would probably be trustee and might feel uncomfortable because the only other way to get someone else's name is you'd have to appoint either a third party co-trustee or or a third party trustee but again it's not a common practice with clients when you're talking about a, a revocable living trust um again that they're that is intended to just avoid probate and hold their assets during their life so assuming he signs on his own he he wouldn't have full anonym, anonymity because he's he's got the trust name but then he's got to sign the Jonathan Wick trustee of but want to look at those because uh, in either scenario. So if he holds, 
in an LLC, it sounds like he, even as an individual, might be subject to the reporting. But again, it maybe there's an accept, exemption there. But what would happen if he holds his house in an LLC? Does John Wick himself, need, is he going to be subject to the CTA? Does he need to file the beneficial ownership report? So this is a pretty common question. People think, you know, I have a single member LLC, which just holds an asset, some piece of real estate. That's not uncommon. Um, it's disregarded for IRS purposes, for tax purposes. So is it disregarded for this? And the answer is no. This is actually precisely the kind of entity they're looking to police. So this is exactly the kind of entity that might be used for illicit activities. It's used in these instances to mask who the owners are. So there's not an exemption if we're just talking about a single member LLC that owns a piece of real property and it's it's a residence that you're not using it to generate $5 million in income and you don't have 20 employees working at this business, really, there's not going to be another exemption for it in the statute unless it were owned by an exempt entity. But let's we'll, we'll just stick with people who are, you know, this is a primary residence being used in this way. So um, there is no exemption here. And even though, like I said, it would be disregarded for tax purposes, this question comes up quite a lot. And I think some people are surprised at this, but it's actually, again, precisely what the what the statute's trying to get at. I think John himself hearing this would be the most surprised that he, uh, if he played forward through the movies and he's he's able to you know escape the reach of the high table, but he can't escape the reach of the CTA. Uh, I think that's pretty funny. <laughs> well, again, you know, a lot of this is done in the real estate world because these are publicly filed, recorded deeds, and so when you have someone signing it and some curious reporter can go through the county records and pull the public records and see, oh, this this person actually signed for this. But again, the the database here is non non public. It's it's rests with the Department of Treasury. It's not supposed to be accessed by anyone. So you don't necessarily immediately have the same exposure by complying with the Corporate Transparency Act as you as you would. So it's it's not. It doesn't blow up the whole strategy is, is what I would say of, of having anonymity for certain purposes because it's not going to be at the state level where it is, and it's non-public. Yeah, and we should make that clear. And we have clients who you know are not engaged in any illicit activity at all and have completely legitimate purposes for wanting to keep their identity or their personal information away from the public. And as I mentioned, we do a fair amount of privacy planning where uh, you can create LLCs or trusts or a combination to do exactly that. So that, especially because an asset like real estate, as you mentioned, title to those deeds or title that's taken on those deeds, th- these are recorded and are accessible by anybody who can, you know, make a trip down to the county recorder's office or uh, uh, access it online. So definitely planning that we do. And again, there's completely legitimate purposes for doing that. And so if John owned his house through the Baba Yaga Family Trust, which like the LLC, I mean, this is a grantor trust for income tax purposes while he's living, you know, disregarded for income tax purposes. Anything that is taxable would be taxable to his own social security number. Is that the same situation as if he held it through an LLC where he would be subject to the CTA or not? No, and I think you you touched on this before. You, you're not filing anything with the Secretary of State to create that trust. It's a it's really a contractual document, so it doesn't initially get picked up by the statute as a potential reporting company. And uh, I assume that general partnerships fall in that same category, given that you technically under state law can have a general partnership without registering it. Or is that maybe a gray area, or is that? It's not great. We do have the option with general partnerships to actually register them with the state, but you do not have to. So I think there's a question as to whether or not. I don't know that you actually. I, I've never registered a general partnership because usually, usually you wouldn't. They just they just exist as a matter of law. There is a question as to whether you go through that additional step of registering your general partnership. Have you now subjected yourself to the Corporate Transparency Act? You may have. And I guess it, it it's worth mentioning, I understand there's a challenge to the CTA that's out there. Uh, any update on that? And, and does that change any of the guidance that, that we would give to a you know potential client? Well, there are actually uh, several challenges. Um, the one that was 
that has actually reached a decision in a federal court was in the Northern District of Alabama. In that instance, the the federal district judge sided with plaintiffs from the Small Business Administration and said that the Corporate Transparency Act was unconstitutional, that there isn't an enumerated power within the U.S. Constitution that says the federal government can regulate this. It's an interesting case. The argument is very interesting. Uh, it's, it is under appeal at the 11th Circuit right now. There are other cases that are bubbling up throughout the country in different jurisdictions. So I think it's probably likely at some point in the next couple of years, this is going to come to a head, at least at the federal level and potentially at the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court's going to have to decide whether or not the U.S. federal government actually has the power to enact this statute. The, the interesting thing to note about the Alabama case, this actually touches on the real estate piece as well, is that, and I'm not a constitutional lawyer, I'm sort of, I'm probably butchering this from law school, but, you know, you have your commerce clause and, you know, again, the the the, the theory under the Northern Alabama case is that there's not an enumerated power in the constitution for Congress to do this. Usually, Statutes like this, they rely on the Commerce Clause, which basically allows them to regulate anything that involves interstate commerce. So it's pretty broad. It's It's been interpreted very broadly over the years. But if you take something like John's house, which is you know a piece of real property that exists within a state, and he forms a single member LLC within the state, I think he's in New Jersey, and he places that house into that single member LLC within the state of New Jersey. No money actually changes hands. He just signs a grant deed to the LLC and now it it sits in that LLC. Has anything involving interstate commerce actually happened there? And so why is it that when he registers that LLC with the Secretary of State of New Jersey that he now has to tell the federal government about it? So like I said, I'm not a constitutional scholar. I think it's an interesting question. It'll be interesting to see what happens on appeal. Obviously, It is being appealed and it's all undecided. For the time being, the holding in that case only applies to the plaintiffs in that case. So they made it very clear that there was no national injunction on the Corporate Transparency Act. But those those plaintiffs, it should be noted, like they don't have to comply with the Corporate Transparency Act right now. The court relieved them of that. So there are some questions from a practitioner's perspective. The Corporate Transparency Act is the law of the land right now. There are court cases that are challenging it. They are going through the the regular appeals process. They're they're going through the regular court process. And, you know, we just have to keep an eye on it. But for the time being, you know, we look at the statute as it exists and say, this is what our clients need to do to comply with it. And that's what we're advising people on. That's great. And and Greg, I want to thank you for all the great points today and information on behalf of the Continental Winston Charlie, John, they all thank you. You'll find when you get home today, there's a box of gold coins with your name (laughs) on it. Uh, They had it delivered, especially uh, just for you. As we end here, we we talk about the verdict, guilty pleasure or not guilty. So if you say guilty, you enjoyed the movie, but feel guilty about it for any reason. Uh, Not guilty, either disliked the movie or you loved it. So it can't possibly be a guilty pleasure. What's your verdict? Uh, Not guilty. You know, maybe this comes from 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 growing up playing a lot of Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter as a kid, but I just I, I loved everything about the movie and uh, just the action of it. It's uh, it's it's such a fun fun film. I've watched it. I don't have a lot of time to watch movies. This is one that I've seen several times, so I was very excited to talk about it. Not guilty. Absolutely agree. I uh, I also played Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter, <laughs> but even if I didn't, I would like to think that everyone would love this. So yeah, not guilty for me as well. And as we wrap up. Uh, What we've learned today is that even if you report to the high table and your colleagues know you as the Baba Yaga, if you own an LLC, limited partnership corporation, or other entity that's registered with the state, you should review the rules under the Corporate Transparency Act to determine if your entity needs to be in compliance. Thanks so much for joining me today. This was this was a lot of fun. This was great. I loved prepping for it. I know there's John Wick 2, 3, 4, and apparently some sequels and spinoffs on the way. Maybe we can do this again. I'd love to. Thanks a lot, Hans. Perfect. I'm Hans Young with my guest, Farella Business Transactions partner, Greg LaSaint, and you've been listening to The Verdict, estate planning through film, brought to you by the private client group at Farella Braun & Martell. Thanks so much for joining us, and keep watching movies. Keep watching movies.